welcome back and uh, we are starting a very important session that is uh, sharing the experience in uh, covid-19 regional perspective and uh, i welcome my co-chair dr nihala besinga who is the president of the college of community physicians sri lanka and we have a very eminent resource persons representing several countries sri lanka malaysia hong kong thailand taiwan and australia so it's going to be a very important session where we share the experience from different countries and i'd like to uh, request dr nihala besinga to introduce the first speaker dr besinga thank you indika and our first uh, speaker today are uh, making the country presentation from sri lanka dr anand vijayvikrama chief infectious disease physician of uh, sri lanka over to you anand uh, thank you very much uh, first i would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity uh, in sri lanka we had our first covid patient diagnosed on 26th of january that was a chinese national and uh, the first local patient was diagnosed on 10th of march by the time of august we had uh, 2841 cases that's for for about uh, a period of 5 months and uh, out of these by that time there were 250 odd active cases with 11 deaths in sri lanka we had applied the quite a strict quarantine process from uh, mid march first we decided to quarantine people who were coming back from italy iran and south korea there were many sri lankan expats who are, who are working in these countries and then uh, for other overseas returnees uh, were asked to self quarantine and then there was a travel ban for selected countries from mid march and the airport was completely closed down on 19 march for passenger flights the government actions were headed with the direct involvement of uh, his excellency the president and the covid task force was headed by direct general of health services and command of army and other committees were headed by key politicians and there were several committees in the ministry of health the quarantine facilities were handled by sri lankan army there were key decisions taken during the period of uh, march and april one is the lockdown of the country then uh, the closure of airport on 14 on 17th of march then involvement of armed forces and the police especially for contact tracing and running the quarantine facilities and then the, when the case numbers went down we started gradual reopening of the country uh, the for the initial 2 3 months uh, there was a lockdown in most part of the country and police was empowered to maintain the lockdown measures during this period only essential services uh, such as health water supply and uh, then the selected services like ports were maintained delivery of food and other essential items were arranged financial allowances were given to selected people so by uh, early uh, week of uh, early part of august the situation was this the even though the total numbers went up it was uh, uh, limited to 2800 odd cases and uh, by that time uh, still the cases were limited to clusters there was no community spread the spread of clusters was controlled with strict active contact tracing and quarantining there was a surge of cases as a cluster occurred in uh, a navy garrison and then there was a rehabilitation uh, center cluster and uh, then but these were controlled well and the, then the mobility restrictions were gradually eased off so this is how we had cases daily cases during this period and you can see couple of uh, spikes in this uh, period due to one due to navy cluster and the, the last one due to the cluster occurred in a rehabilitation center but they were well, very well controlled and then there were no cases reported from the community for two months and then the day to day functions are started but then un- unfortunately the people become complacent and then we had another spike which is still continuing now the case numbers are gradually going up with the total cases ranging to around 28000 however when we consider these cases and the recovery the sri lanka is doing pretty well with the uh, recovery rate Uh, of almost 73 percent, which is higher than the average global rate, and uh, when we come to fatality rate comparison, Sri Lanka is again doing very well 
with a fatality rate of 0.5%. However, I must say probably this number, the, the denominator is the total number of cases including the asymptomatic cases as we do a lot of contract tracing, uh, many asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic cases are detected. Uh, these are detected by doing PCR testing and initially in March and February the PCR tests were done around uh, 50 to 70 tests per day but then the case numbers were gradually increased, uh, the PCR testing were gradually increased and by now we do around 14,000 uh, PCR tests per day and up to now we have done almost 1 million uh, uh, PCR testing of this sort of population of uh, 22 million. When we come to the management of these cases, uh, at present the policy is to admit all cases, all COVID positive people to hospitals or intermediate treatment centers, that's for the purpose of monitoring and prevention of spread. Since the numbers are, even though they are, that is going up, since the numbers are still limited, we can afford to do that. Uh, the asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic patients are in uh, intermediate centers where they are monitored and the patients with uh, moderate to severe illness are admitted to hospitals for treatment and monitoring. There's quite active contract tracing using public health network, which, uh, which Sri, Lanka has a, Sri Lanka has a very good public health network. And also in addition to that, the state intelligence services also involved in this. And the quarantining of contacts is done either in their own house or in, uh, when it is not possible uh, in quarantine centers and they are monitored and the testing of contacts is done if they develop symptoms early or if not uh, at the end of 14 days. In addition, uh, there's uh, quite a uh, bit of preparedness in the health sector with uh, having more facilities with oxygen, more than ventilators is stressed on having more facilities with oxygen and uh, the ventilator facilities are developed in places where we are planning to have future intensive care units and then uh, we have to do a lot of work on reducing phobia and stigma, then uh, the guidelines are being prepared and then there is the preparation for vaccine if and when it is available for purchasing, storing and uh, prioritization etc. We encourage uh, managing these patients, we have uh, in, in these open wards, most of our old hospitals have this sort of open wards with very good ventilation and sunlight. And uh, we can afford to do this in our, our climate and I think it is a, it is a blessing uh, to prevent cross-infection, the hospital acquired infections and also probably the, the outcome. The, at early March, the expert committee uh, on clinical management in the country uh, had several meetings and uh, with the available limited evidence, we decided to give, use hydroxychloroquine for symptomatic COVID positive patients, which we still continue in spite of uh, lack of uh, adequate evidence, I would say. Uh, other antivirals are not recommended, uh, not used. And aspirin, recently we started using aspirin uh, prophylactically for high risk COVID positive patients. And also we use uh, low molecular weight heparin for hypoxic COVID patients. And then there have been many other guidelines made on quarantining after exposure and discharging and so on. The present situation as of yesterday was uh, we have had total confirmed cases reported of 28,580 of which uh, 7,634 7, people are in either in hospitals or in intermediate care centers. Uh, 20,000 plus cases have recovered and discharged from these facilities and we had had 140 deaths out of this uh, with the, that is a mortal rate of 0.5%. Uh, however, we are facing with new challenges because of the gradual increase of number of cases with intermittent lockdown of selected areas, we have been able to control the rise of these uh, cases rapidly, however, still the things are, are still gradually rising and uh, then uh, with the very active social media worldwide and in locally also there's persistent fear created by them and stigma especially created among general public which is uh, which is a problem in uh, detecting cases and also uh, interfering with uh, normal day to day life uh, and of course with the economic difficulties we have as well as the world is having 
we have opened up economic activities uh, at present uh, we have opened up many activities that we'll have to improve and of course there's a plan to for example a plan to start tourism from 1st of january uh, th this has been a big blow to our country because in 2019 sri lanka was voted as the best tourist destination in the world and uh, when the tourism was started to bloom uh, we had this covid and uh, as in many other countries we had to shut down and uh, stop tourism but we are planning to start in from next uh, january and uh, and we hope with uh, adequate restrictions uh, still uh, it will improve and and many of you would be able to come to sri lanka and uh, visit sri lanka and to see the place thank you thank you very much dr anand we'll be taking questions later however if you have any questions from the audience uh, you can just type them in the chat and our resource persons they will answer uh, whenever they are available during the session so we will move to the next presentation that's from malaysia and uh, dr sanjay rampal lekraj rampal who is the head of department from the department of social and preventive medicine from the university of malaya he be doing the malaysia country presentation sanjay rampal over to you thank, thank you, you professor, professor. So, so just, just like, like to confirm, confirm that, that you can, can see, see my screen. My screen. Uh, yes, you can, if you can. Yes, brilliant. Thank All you. Right. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sanjay. I'm from Malaysia. I'm the head of the Department for Social and Preventive Med uh, Medicine at the University of Malaysia. And I will be presenting some lessons learned and maybe a way forward for COVID-19 pandemic. So, so first of all, all we, we get, get to the situation, situation in Malaysia. Malaysia. So in, so in Malaysia, Malaysia we, we, we recognize that there have, have been multiple waves of uh, COVID, COVID, major COVID-19 COVID outbreaks. And, and as you can, can see from this graph, this graph may look a bit uh, populated at first, first a bit busy, but, but it, it supplies a few important information. Number one is it gives you the epidemic curve. And from the epidemic curve, you can clearly see that we have had actually two major outbreaks. And, and overlying the epidemic curve, curve uh, we, also, we, also, also, we have also put the transmissibility, the, the time varying reproductive, reproductive number. number. So, so whenever, whenever the red line goes up, up that means there is an uh, increase in transmission. transmission. Overlaying that, that also there is this uh, movement control, control order periods. This is periods whereby the Malaysian government has taken specific policy initiatives to prevent and control COVID-19 in Malaysia. And so, and so you, you can, can see, see that, that we have, have one major, major policy, policy initiative from the 18th, 18th of March to the 3rd of May, May whereby at the bottom, the bottom of the figure, figure you can also see a, a stringency index, index of the various, various uh, methods, methods and various, various activities that we can use to prevent and control COVID-19, COVID including uh, movement restriction, border, border control, control, work from home, so on and so forth. So so, so as you can, can see, see that, that uh, in March, March, the government actually instituted, instituted a very thorough lockdown, lockdown whereby they instructed, they instructed most of the population to work from home, schools were closed, so on and so forth. Uh, this, this order was actually was relaxed on the 4th of, of, of May, whereby, whereby you can see there's a decrease in number of cases. And in the 9th, 9th of June, we went into a period of recovery, whereby there was a relaxing of a lot of economic activities so that economic activities can start up. Now, now, from this epidemic curve, you can see that sometime in September, October, there, there, had, there was a spate of cases. And this spate of cases actually uh, was introduced uh, via importation through uh, maybe laxity in border control, whereby there, 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 there some importation, importation of cases that got uh, to one of the regions in Malaysia. And that outbreak then very fast spread throughout Malaysia. And as you can see on the right-hand side, is when, the, when we are having our current major outbreak going on. And uh, in, in response to the second major wave, the government actually introduced on the 7th of October, they again increased restrictions, as you can see from the redness of the various uh, stringency index, that whereby we were made to work from home, schools were closed, so on and so forth. However, the government has relaxed um, many of the travel restrictions and movement restrictions since this week in order to spur the economy. 
Now, in addition to the table, I'll just I, in addition to the figure, I'll just show you this figure. This figure is actually an interesting figure on population mobility. And in, if, if you look at the pillars of prevention, border control, movement restriction, physical distancing, uh, hygiene, and personal protection. So with regards to movement restriction, you can see that whenever there is a community-wide quarantine or community-wide lockdown, movement is greatly restricted. However, it does come with a cost. It comes with a cost to financial, economic, and psychological social cost. Now, trying to place Malaysia in the world is very interesting because sometimes the media, our national media, play up the incidence of COVID-19 in, in our respective countries. So trying to figure out our ranking in the world helps, and this is what the department has tried to do. But by what we did is we ranked a certain number of countries uh, using three monthly incident density of COVID-19 cases. And as you can see here in the first slide, that initial rank in 101 in the March to May period, the three month period. And we currently rank uh, 100 in the last uh, three months. So, so com relatively, relatively, our ranking has not changed, changed but, but when you compare, compare with Southeast Asia, Asia we, can we can gain some, some insight into how the other countries in Southeast Asia, Asia have fared. And, and among them is Singapore, Singapore, Singapore has been a very good success story, whereby they, they, they had initial outbreaks, but they currently they are currently ranked 128. And you also have these these countries with, with low uh, low incidence, Thailand, Vietnam, and Taiwan, Taiwan, China, China even, even Japan, Japan has been relatively low, low right? right? Now, now if, if you, you compare, compare, you also have New Zealand and Australia, which, have, which are relatively low, low. But one, one thing you do notice, notice with, with many, many of these countries, countries with low, uh, low, low incident density, is they are very insular. That means they are they're either islands, islands or countries, countries with good border controls. Now, if you look at the Middle East, and here you can see Sri Lanka's, how Sri Lanka fares. So Sri Lanka initially fared at 140, but they have been trending upwards in the past month or so, past few months actually. The, the trajectory of incidents in Sri Lanka is actually very similar to Malaysia in, in, the, car, in, in the past few months. Now, in addition to that, you can see that the, the, in the region of America and Europe, Malaysia does much better than them. And I think that this is one big takeaway that we have and that we can use when addressing the media. That incident, the incidents in our, in our respective countries may increase, but when you compare it relative to many other countries, we, we, many of the Asian countries are doing relatively well. Now, coming to lessons learned, I think one very important lesson that has been that is out there is that public health services are essential, right? The infrastructure is essential, the implementation and the delivery of public health services are essential. The second lesson to be learned, and I think even uh, the, 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 the speaker from Sri Lanka has said this, is we need a whole of government approach towards prevention. In Malaysia, the government recognized this as a threat to national security, thus the response, the, the response to this COVID-19 threat is coordinated by the National Security Council. They receive input from all ministries, they receive input from the ministries of health and all the other ministries, but the action per se, the policies per se are released by the National Security Council. Now, in addition to that, one good interesting thing that, that we, we got here in Malaysia is that we have an official unified risk communication strategy. That, that we have been having daily briefings by the Director General of Health with regards to health-related matters. And at the same time, we have been having daily press briefings by the Minister of Defence on all other related policies and implementation of policies. So I think this basically is a very good risk communication strategy. Now, one thing though is that politics matter during this COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic is here for a long duration, right? So strong public health interventions require political support. Political support is affected by political stability, media representation of the national outbreaks and the global pandemic, and public opinion. I think this is very important. Whereby not, Not only the, the, politi the, the, the politicians, politicians are important, the, but, the but the support is affected by various factors. factors. We, also we also have polarization, polarization of public opinion, opinion typically uh, globally, globally influenced, influenced by political and philosophical outlooks. Now, now, social norms are heavily influenced by how our political leaders act. Now, coming to what to a very important aspect of this is the media, right? So, for politicians to act, they need 
the support of the media. Sometimes the media may, may tend to present uh, different perspectives on an issue. So it's very important that public health professionals come out and balance the media. So here the public health at UM, the, the group of us have responded by giving better translation and media advocacy. We have, we have set up a COVID-19 uh, uh, web page where up to now we have 331 posts on COVID-19 related matters. We have also developed a COVID-19 epidemiology for Malaysia dashboard, whereby the lay, lay person, that means those who are in ministries, can get up-to-date information with various epidemiological indicators of the pandemic. Now, in addition to that, another very important lesson, I think, is that we are susceptible. And I think we may get this over and over again when we look at the different regions, is that we had a first wave, we handled the first wave well, we had a break, and then we have a second wave. Now, that there is a narrative out there that the second wave is due to laxity or non-compliance of the public. I don't think so. I just think we are susceptible. So if we are susceptible, we are bound to get infected if the susceptibility there pre-exists, right? So the, so the main point is that this pandemic will be char is characterized and will be characterized by major outbreak that vexes and greens. Future vaccination program it, it may play a role, but actually there's a lot of uncertainty there. Now another important point is community goodwill is limited. Population fatigue is real, and we should all be very aware of it. And, and so, so that, that it is very important for public health professionals to actually balance the intensity of our public health interventions based on transmission dynamics or based on burden of disease. Now, this, this is another very important point that doesn't get enough uh, headlines, is the limitations of a science, right? The limitations of a science. The science of the disease is evolving. I frequently see very strong causal interpretations of research findings, and we should be very careful of this. There's, There's a lack, lack of acknowledgement of the uncertainty of the science. science. In addition to that, we also we have polarized interpretations, which may be biased by the classes of what one wants, how one perceives the evidence. Now, another important point is vulnerable populations and collateral damage. We must all acknowledge that policies unequally affect our populations. Vulnerable populations are more affected by our policies. An important point is closed system dense populations, such as prisons, detention centers, and hostels, need to be supported and protected because when there is an infection imported into the closed system, the, the, the transmission is unabated. The transmission is very high. We also need to emphasize modifying socio ecological factors rather than just concentrating on individual responsibility. Now, we also have the need to emphasize increased community disaster resilience, and we should acknowledge that there has been disruption of other national programs, NCD, NCD, including immunization, due to the, over, due to the prioritization or over-prioritization of COVID-19. Now, the way forward that I see that we should be moving forward is, number one, we should balance the benefit to harm. We should take the cost into account. Right? right, this, this is, is a long term, term game we are playing, so we need a long term preventive strategy and we, and we need, need to utilize, utilize so we need to develop, develop sustainable approaches for the future. future. So, so, with that, that I, would I would like, like to acknowledge many members and my doctoral students and uh, uh, my, my colleagues from the department, department who have contributed uh, in, in one way or another to, to, to this presentation. And I also would like to uh, thank the steering committee for COVID 19 preparedness and response in, at UMMC. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. So, so good, good afternoon. afternoon. My, My name, name is Peng Wu. I'm, I'm from, from the University, University of Hong Kong. Kong. I am privileged to, to share with you our experience in response, response to COVID-19 in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. So, so early this morning, morning Professor Pierres talked about science behind the interventions against COVID-19. In, in my talk, I will try to use population-based data to illustrate potential effectiveness of different measures in control of COVID-19 in Hong Kong. We have gone through three epidemics of COVID-19 so far, and now in the middle of the fourth wave, 
So, so up to yesterday, yesterday there have been around 7,000 cases reported. In the, in the first two waves, waves most of the cases are import, uh, were imported, showing as the flu bars, while the majority of third and fourth waves were local infections, showing red and orange. So, uh, actually, in Hong Kong, travel-based, case-based, and community-based interventions have been implemented since January. But we have never applied territory-wide or district-wide lockdown measures. Um, travel-based measures are largely travel restrictions, border control measures aiming to control importation of in infections. Compared to earlier, uh, Early, early last year, there have been more than 99% reduction in passengers coming into Hong Kong through the airport. And we suspended most of the land transportation between Hong Kong and mainland China. Case-based interventions were about case identification, detection, and testing, while community-based interventions are largely moderate uh, physical distancing measures. We made use of contact tracing information to reclassify cases identified in Hong Kong into imported cases and those linked to the imported, show uh, here in box. The cases linked to imported cases show in red boxes, uh, the red box, uh, blue bars, largely reflect the risk of transmission from importation, which was estimated as the effective reproductive numbers. We found very limited transmission from importation in Hong Kong after February when mandatory quarantine and other travel-based measures were implemented. Approximately 93% reduction in transmission from importation was associated with travel-based measures used in Hong Kong show in the lower panel here. We have, we have been conducting, conducting population-based telephone, telephone service to monitor pop population behaviors in response to COVID-19 since January. So far, more than 30 surveys have been conducted. We've seen a universal face mask wearing showing in the red dots, dots here. Uh, and people in Hong Kong have been maintaining very good hand hygiene practices shown as these uh, green and blue dots. And I used the similar way to look at imported cases. We estimated the risk of transmission of local infections because this part is the most worrying part for us to prevent, uh, you know, to control COVID-19. Work from home is one of the major physical distancing measures used during the epidemic waves. It appeared to be associated with 64% and 56% percent reduction in local transmission in the second and third waves. We're using, we're working on the data of the third or fourth wave. And the additional physical distancing measures also implemented in Hong Kong using in high risk facilities, including service restrictions in restaurants, bars, gyms, and other places. These measures were associated with 64% and 18% reduction in transmission in those two waves. Actually, testing capacity for SARS-CoV-2 has been substantially extended in Hong Kong from a few hundred tests down the day in January, in January to February to more than 10,000 a day in July to August. Hong Kong Department of Health has been conducting tests and trace on each confirmed cases. All close contacts were quarantined in government-designated quarantine centers, but test and trace approach may not function very well when the capacity in manpower and testing were challenged by fast growth in confirmation of infections. We actually noticed that during uh, mid-July, there was a sudden drop in number of tests done uh, with the samples largely collected from quarantine centers and community outbreak investigations, these uh, missing uh, bars here. This might be, uh, might be due to a short of manpower at that time in conducting contact tracing, 
We estimated that this disruption in the test and trace were probably associated with about 30% increase in transmission during that time. Silver spreading was a typical feature of coronavirus infections, including SARS and MERS. This phenomenon seems also to be observed in COVID-19. Using contact tracing data, we noticed that in the first two waves, around uh, a thousand confirmed cases and average half were associated with more than 100 clusters. Among these clustered cases, about 60% relate to local infection, and the largest cluster shown here uh, involved uh, 106 cases, which could be traced back to several bars in the city. This single outbreak actually accounted for 10% of all cases identified at that time and also about one-third of all local infections during the same time period. Based on these data, we found that around actually 70% of local identified cases did not infect anyone else. We inferred that 90% of SARS-CoV-2 infections were responsible for 80% of, of all local transmission events occurred in the first two waves in Hong Kong. Although transmission routes of SARS-CoV-2 have not been fully characterized, we are still very interested in to know how much COVID-19 would affect children. Given the similar characteristics of this virus to some other respiratory viruses, as part of the responses to COVID-19, all kindergartens, primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong did not resume after Chinese New Year holiday in late January until late May to June. There were no local cases in school-aged children until early July when local transmission went up in the third wave. Schools actually were closed again on 13th of July. During the third wave in July to August, there were 20 cases identified in children, illustrated here. And many of these cases attended school while being infectious. But no other school-aged infections related to these 20 cases have been reported. It may suggest that multiple potential introductions of COVID-19 into schools did not lead to onward transmission, which um, sounds a good news. This might be because children, especially younger ones, could be less efficient spreaders of COVID-19 as suggested uh, by other studies, or school-based interventions implemented in Hong Kong were effective in preventing transmission. So in general, our experience in Hong Kong indicated that epidemics could be suppressed without complete lockdowns. More specifically, travel-based measures were essential to reduce importation of the infection. Work from home and other physical distancing measures applied in high-risk places were effective in suppressing local transmission. Given the observed super spreading events, uh, of COVID-19, attention should be paid particularly to risk of transmission in some high-risk settings, such as mass gatherings, bars and restaurants, etc. Face masks and test and trace are necessary, but may not be sufficient to stop transmission. As we noticed that many transmission events occurred in situations where masks were not worn, and the continuous expansion of testing capacity did not stop the spread. Transmission in schools seem to be less efficient, which needs a further investigation. So what next? Continuous, uh, given the global situation of COVID-19, there would be continuous importation, so travel-based uh, measures should be important. Government has to balance the health and economic need during this pandemic and therefore may consider some risk-based measures 
such as travel bubbles, constant introduction of importation, and undetected infections in the community make it possible to see threaded local infections and outbreaks from time to time. So we also need better approach to identify local cases as early as possible. So lastly, the increased community outbreaks of acute respiratory infections due to other pathogens in this winter we observe in Hong Kong may cause challenges in control of COVID-19. This closes my talk today. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wu Peng. I think we are learning a lot of important things from this uh, uh, this uh, symposium, the similarities between different countries and the importance of basic preventive measures. So I think it's a really good learning experience and I request all the participants to make the maximum use of this valuable and precious symposium where the, the, the top national level leaders have joined together and presenting their country experiences. You can send your questions in the chat so that we can direct them to the resource persons. And then now we are moving towards Thailand. Thailand is one country uh, which actually reported the first patient very soon after China. But uh, after that, Thailand has basically adapted to basic preventive measures and managed to control the situation very effectively. So I would like to invite a key person from Thailand. That's uh, Dr. Taranak Plipat, uh, who is a Deputy Director General, Department of Disease Control, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. Over to you, Dr. Taranak. Thank you very much um, and thank you for the invitation to join such a very important um, um, session. I would like to share my, our experience in Thailand um, starting from the beginning and talk about what we, what we have learned and what we are going to do next um, and most of my presentation will be about the public health measure and not going into the clinical um, presentation of the patients. Um, before, I would like to mention a little bit about what we have prior to the epidemics and a lot of things that make us successful fighting uh, the pandemic today has been established long, long time ago. So there are a lot of things that we cannot um, just um, do it right now and hope that it will help us um, during the, this outbreak. Um, for example, our primary healthcare programs was established more than 40 years ago. Um, it was established in 1977. These programs was so fundamental and it gave us um, a village health volunteers. Um, currently, in the countries that have about 60 to 70 million people, um, we have more than 1 million health volunteers. Another very important program is field epidemiology training programs, which started since 1980s. Our programs was the first one outside North America. So when talking about epidemiology capacities, we have been implemented these capacities um, long, long time ago. Um, although in the beginnings, we focus on the two years trainings of the physicians. Later on, um, we focus on so many different um, strategies. We have tier-based um, trainings that create several um, tiers for different level of technical expertise in epidemiology. These programs lead to more than 1,000 disease control unit, which is uh, an investigation team. Um, for the first phase of epidemics, we were able to investigate most of the cases that occur in the countries, um, doing um, investigation, doing contact tracing, using both disease control unit and also village health volunteers. We started, um, our what we call national health security programs that um, create an access to healthcare for free for all Thai citizens back in 2002. Um, this helped us quite a lot. So anybody who maybe contact COVID-19, they don't need, they don't have to hesitate whether they should go to the, to see the doctors or not because they don't have to pay 
for their investigation and treatment. Um, we have public health emergency programs initiated in 2007. This program put together all the component of public health emergency management together. And we initiate, or I would like to say, re-engineer re our emergency operation centers um, again in 2012. Those give us a capacity, very important capacity to, to um, tackle the epidemics. Another um, very important uh, part that we have learned was that we have so many experience um, dealing with um, emerging infectious disease in the past. We have problem with SARS. We have to handle um, avian influenza H5N1. We have experience with Zika virus infection, um, pandemic influenza H1N1. All of this experience help us prepare for this pandemic very well. After we have SARS outbreak, we put together um, our um, Department of Disease Control strategic frameworks that has focused on public health emergency management, um, as I mentioned earlier, since 2007. Um, we take care of the IHR capacities, and also we were part of the global health security agenda um, countries that trying to help ourselves and others in improving the capacities um, that will handle the, the problem with, with, um, with pandemics. For the COVID-19, after we hear about um, the situation in China, um, starting with about 27 cases of unknown pneumonias in January, uh, in December 31st last year, we start to watch the situation carefully and monitor how many travelers from China travel to Bangkok and other provinces. On January 3rd this year, um, China report 44 cases. And after we collect the information about how many Chinese travel to Thailand, Chinese traveler travel to Thailand, on January 3rd, we activate our emergency operation centers and starts um, the surveillance of COVID-19 among, among the travelers. If you remember um, on January 3rd, um, the, the, the Chinese did not really say what caused um, the epidemics or pandemic yet. Um, they announced it on January 10th, but by that time, Thailand already has a suspected case. Uh, the first cases travel to Thailand on January 8th. At that time, we do diagnosis using an exclusion. We do a lot of testing on seropathogens. If they are all negative, then we are going to test them for family-wide um, coronavirus. And that make us um, be able to detect the cases even before the Chinese release the full genome sequencing of coronavirus. So on after we initiate our, our emergency operations, we set up the goals or the target for controls by, um, we did not really expect that, that we are not going to have any cases in the country. So our goal was to be detect the case very early and be able to spread, uh, to control the spread of the disease. We would like to minimize the case fatality, fatality proportion among cases and minimize the health impact of COVID-19. We, we wish to also mitigate socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 as well. Those are our main three goals um, that we use during the preparation and also during the response phase. These are the timelines that tell about what happened. So on January 3rd, we have um, activated our emergency operation first at the Department of Disease Control. On January 8, we have the first confirmed case arrived in Bangkok. She has fevers and were detected at the airport. And on January 13, we announced that we identified the first case, the first confirmed case. That, those, that are the first confirmed case um, outside China. Um, in January, we have um, a few cases here and there. All of them are um, imported cases. Starting on February, we start to see the local transmission of COVID-19 in the countries. We are the second countries um, after Japan to report local transmission. Um, so in February, we have a mix between the case, the import 
the cases and local transmission cases. Um, starting in March, we start to see a rise in number of cases, um, but with, because we have three cluster. The first cluster was among the people who travel, who uh, visit the um, nightclub in Bangkok. Second cluster was among the Muslim pilgrims who come back from Malaysia and Indonesia. Most of them live in the deep south. And the third cluster um, was among the people who visit the boxing matches. Um, there are three important boxing matches um, during the times. So after the increase, increasing in number of cases, the Centers for COVID Situation Administration um, was established and then um, start to work. The approach that we used was the whole of government and the whole of society's approach. Everybody in the government and everyone in the societies will um, also participate in the planning and in the execution of the plan. In, on March 24th, um, we, uh, the government declared state of emergencies. If you look at the, at the, at the epidemics curve, you will see that the declarations of, um, of state of emergencies uh, occur after um, the number of cases um, was peaked already. Um, on April 3rd, we implement the curfews and early on April, we also um, have the travel ban. That is, um, the anybody who would like to come into the country need to ask for the permission and we ban all the flight that will land in Bangkok. On May 3rd, we start to ease the lockdown. And our last case of the first phase um, occurred on May 25th. After May 25th, we went about 100 days um, without any confirmed case. Um, we start to have case again, reported confirmed case again. That is the, the local transmission um, on September 3rd. That was um, the sporadic cases that we detected. We started to identify cases here and there, but not very frequent. Most of the cases are the people who travel from abroad and enter the quarantine facilities. So most of the number, when you look at um, how many Thai reported the new cases, um, almost all of them were um, travelers from abroad and were detected at quarantine facilities. Recently, we, um, after Myanmar has epidemics, we, we start to have problem among uh, um, at the Thai and Myanmar borders. Um, first, we have um, the drivers from Myanmar detected uh, at the borders. Then we have problem with some illegal migrants, uh, immigrants from Myanmar. Um, recently, we have Thai returnees from Myanmar and Malaysia detected as cases. Um, currently, the Thai returnees from Myanmar who came into the country illegally, um, 30 of them were detected as confirmed cases. And those 30s um, has also transmitted um, the disease to Thai, um, to Thai as well. Uh, we have two local transmission from the Thai returnees from Myanmar. Um, just this week, we start to see um, the transmission within the quarantine facilities. Um, one of the first um, transmission we, we observed was among the travelers. And this week we have um, the transmission from the travelers to um, number of healthcare workers. Um, but those has already been identified and the, all the cases recently has been investigated and hopefully we will be able to control the situation that that we are facing at the moment. Um, in July, after we control the first phase of, epidem of epidemics, um, we request and we work with the WHO to come in to do an external intra action review. And these are the success factors as reported by uh, external evaluators from the WHO. Um, Thailand's success factors uh, Success factors include strong leadership. Um, this I would like to say at all levels, um, from the prime minister down to village level. Um, those leaders also use the best available scientific evidence to guide their decision and guide their policy and measures. Secondly, um, we have a very strong and well resources and inclusive medical and public health um, systems. 
Third, we have consistent and transparent communication leading to um, compliance to public health measures. Um, these are very important. Um, the, after we initiate um, the Centers for COVID-19 um, Situation Administrations, we have, um, we have focus on, on communications and communication come out um, directly from the Office of the Prime Ministers. Um, we have a very good administrative system so that we can adjust our, our work and our, um, sit, our administrative within Ministry of Public Health and other ministry so that we can have such capacity to deal with COVID-19. The previous experience, as I mentioned earlier, also are major factors in working with COVID-19. And of course, we use whole of society approach um, that's include academics and also the private sectors. These are the success factors that was reported out from the WHO IAR interaction review. The WHO also um, recommend uh, that we should also improve on several areas that we are not perfect and we know that. Um, for example, um, we should um, work on improving in our information, um, especially uh, moving from information for action. Our information um, are good, but not as, as fast as we would like to have. Um, we, we need to work more in protecting health workers and also patients since we have a few um, nosocomial infection um, in the first phase. We need to improve our detection. Um, we strengthen our need to strengthen our laboratories. We need to strengthen our workforce. We need to strengthen our quarantine programs. And we also need to enhance the, the coordination even better than, than before. Currently, um, Ministry of Public Health itself um, work on several issues. For example, we would like to strengthen our port of entry quarantine facilities as recommended by the WHO as well. Um, so we would increase the number you see is the number that we would like to increase to. Um, um, we currently have, as I mentioned earlier, communicable disease control unit, 1,000 communicable disease control unit. We would like to increase those number up to 3,000 to 5,000. And we are implementing those, um, those capacity strengthening as I, as I speak. We need to increase the number of um, ICU beds uh, up to 1,000 and uh, 1,000 to 1,300 beds and hospital beds as well. So these are the, the, our plan to expand our capacity so that we can handle if we have any um, second wave um, occur in the countries. Uh, we are trying our best to prevent that, but um, we all know that um, if we are not very careful, then it's, 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 it can happen to us. Um, another issue that we are currently working on is to balancing the health and the wealth. Um, these are very important. Uh, we have been working very well on preventing the health of the population. Um, we are planning and the government um, is also working very hard to improve the wealth of Thai people as well. Um, this will be very hard because, um, or because of the situation, not just in Thailand, but um, the worldwide. Um, as I discussed, um, we, have, we have been um, working on this for quite some time. It's almost when I talk with the media, as I would say, we are very close to one year anniversaries. Um, starting from, if you remember so well, uh, we start our operations in um, January 3rd. So we are working on COVID-19 for close to a year now. And hopefully we will be able to uh, mitigate the effect as we set our goals on and also improve um, the economic situation in the country as well. Um, I would like to conclude my presentation and thank you very much for, for a chance to be able to share Thai experience with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan Narak Wilford, Deputy Director General, Department of Disease Control, Ministry of Public Health, Thailand. And it's very impressive presentation and congratulations to Thailand uh, having a good control uh,
from the initial wave and and you were you were very rightly uh, you did the uh, review uh, to yeah. identify your That's weaknesses and now you are strengthening your weaknesses thank you very much for that experience sharing and next we will move to the last speaker today from taiwan dr ya wen betty chu chu taipei medical university taiwan over to you uh, dr ya wen okay hi everyone i'm betty from taipei medical university and my another hat is apaf regional director of taiwan uh it's a great honor to be here today so i would like to start my presentation from this photo taken on April 14th outside the uh, Grand Hotel, they show zero, Z-E-R-O, zero confirmed case. This is the very first day after uh, three months of struggling. Taiwan celebrates the first day of zero confirmed case. And it showed the determination of Taiwanese people that we made it and uh, we will work together. Okay, this is me. Uh, you can find me uh, through the email and we have a Facebook. And now I'm the director of our global health program, College of Public Health in TMU. Okay, so everyone knows the uh, global situation now. There are more than 1.5 million of deaths already and still increasing. In Taiwan, we have a uh, big wave in March. And so far we are doing um, okay. Okay, We have a total of 716 confirmed cases and uh, seven deaths. There's no locally acquired cases since April, no deaths cases since May 11th. And we are hoping to stop the second wave. And uh, so far uh, we have two number which are uh, Word number one from the bottom. Okay. One is the confirmed death, and another number is the economic decline. So uh, I would like to share our six key factors uh, learned from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. First, we learn from the SARS uh, experience a lot. And since then we stay high alert and do timely response. Three, we uh, keep very good uh, risk communication and uh, information transparency. Do proper resource allocation and uh, uh, control the transmission prevention well with the tracking system. And uh, six is uh, the teamwork of Taiwan citizen. Okay, SARS is a bad experience, but good lesson to Taiwan. Okay. Back then, more than 30 countries and uh, more than 8,000 cases worldwide. And in Taiwan, we have 346 infected, 73 deaths. Among number, one third cases are actually health workers, including 11 deaths. And it's a very shocking lesson because a series of nosocomial infection were found mainly in hospitals, which means our border control was not functioning very, very well. Okay, so the outbreak uh, was found in hospitals and caused uh, 820 million US dollars economic loss. And back in 17 years ago, there is no cross agency integration mechanism in government. We were excluded from WHO lack of international support and uh, um, the hospital lockdown caused a panic among health personnel and the citizens a lot. This is a photo uh, taken on um, uh, April year 2003, the sudden lockdown of Taipei Municipal Hoping Hospital. Uh, just um, shocking the whole uh, society of Taiwan. The health personnel crying out from the window they said, we don't want to wait and die here. Please do proper isolation and the quarantine, separate the healthy and the unhealthy people. So since then, we uh, started a lot of regulatory review and the organizational adjustment. We amended 
Communicable Disease Control Act at least twice and established the National Health Command Center. Uh, we learned that from US CDC and the Department of Health of the US. And this time, uh, because of this good foundation, we can establish the COVID-19 Central Epidemic Command Center in a very short amount of time. And this is the structure of the uh, NHCC, the Command Center, which is a cross-agency integration system with three sections, uh, the logistics, operation, and the intelligence section, which is very special and led by the advisory group composed by uh, experts and uh, scholars. And the other sections are actually composed by uh, high-ranking officers from more than 10 different ministries. So this CCC is actually uh, led by a team of experts and they made all the important decisions based on uh, current and updated evidence. And uh, this expert team continuously adjusts case definitions and the criteria for case reporting, revises clinical and the medical treatment recommendations all the time. And uh, we are very lucky, our top leaders, uh, there are several, one who has public health training and uh, a very uh, well-known epidemiologist, including the former vice president of Taiwan, Dr. Uh, Chen Jianren, and uh, uh, Dr. Lai Qing, the current vice president of Taiwan, MD, MPH. Uh, Dr. Chen Qimai, the former vice premier, also with MD degree and uh, uh, public health training. So here in the APF meeting, I would like to emphasize again that public health education really matters. And this is photo to show that our premier, Su Zheng Chang, visited the command center very often. And our president, Tsai Ing-wen, also uh, supported the CCC a lot and uh, uh, visited the, uh, the CCC uh, many times to give full support and the encouragement. Our president Tsai was recently elected by the Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And if I may quote, they said, it's hard to find a world leader who's had a better 2020 than Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen. She won re-election in January, oversaw one of the world's best response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the helmed an economic recovery. And when compared with these two gentlemen who was diagnosed with COVID-19 once and twice, I think our um, leader is pretty healthy and strong. Okay, so since uh, we have high alert and uh, uh, timely response, it started from the New Year Eve of 2019. Taiwan CDC noticed information from social media indicated that there are at least seven atypical pneumonia cases were reported in Wuhan, China. And we immediately called a press conference and started on board quarantine of passengers on direct flights from Wuhan. This is the uh, notice uh, uh, we cut. Okay, it shows that a typical pneumonia cases was reported with emergency notification. And this is announced by the Wuhan Health Committee. I have to say that uh, we are very lucky because we also can read Chinese. All right, and we started very strict border control since then. We banned the entry of Chinese nationals from Hubei since January 26, 26 including Hong Kong and Macau on February 11th. And we kept monitoring international situation and adjusting travel notices. And so um, travelers are subject to mandatory self-health management and quarantine for 14 days depend on the country they come from. And we started to ban all the foreign nationals to enter Taiwan since March 19. Even the Taiwanese people uh, on a charter flight uh, arrive at our um, Taoyuan airport and they have to be fully equipped with the PPE all the way before they get on the plane and get off the plane. And all the passengers' luggage 
in the airport will be disinfected by the personnel. And we sent um, quarantine personnel to board uh, on the sea cruise to carry out quarantine work uh, and do physical examination. And here I would like to call it personal border control. Okay, Taiwanese people learn from the SARS experience. So they start to wear masks and line up to buy masks in front of the pharmacy to do self-protection, just in case the uh, public border control is not functioning. So our uh, command center hosts the uh, daily press conference every day. And uh, uh, our capacity of 1922 Consultation Hawaii has been increased and we will post official uh, outbreak situation and uh, the updates on the official line in the Facebook accounts and provide more than six different languages of promotional material to cover different groups of people, including migrant workers and uh, foreigners to make sure we leave no one behind. This is the photo taken in the command center daily conference. And we even have the sign language interpreter to uh, help the deaf people to understand everything. And this is the uh, command uh, and also the Minister of Health and Welfare, Dr. Chen Shizhong in Taiwan. And he's kind of like a hero now. And uh, we use our uh, IT technique and the link the National Health Insurance Database with the National Immigration Agency data to protect our frontline healthcare workers so they can immediately aware of suspected infections based on the travel history and the symptoms. The e-referral platform added designated healthcare facilities for testing and uh, the medical system also displays the notice when the testing has not been completed. We have a um, national IC card uh, link with the mass distribution system and more than 20 million people have purchased masks in the system from the open data platform. And we make sure the face masks were distributed to 22 local governments to protect the personnel in healthcare institutions and coordinate with the uh, producers to make sure the supply is always uh, enough. This is the digital fencing tracking system I mentioned. Okay. The location of people in home isolation and quarantine will be monitored through the signal of their mobile phone. And if the signal is not correct or abnormal, warning will be sent to the people, to health agency and to the police. And if they ignore the warning, the penalty, the penalty can be up to 35,000 USD per person. And this is very useful um, measure with a legal base. And finally, I would like to uh, give the credits to all the Taiwanese citizens because most people understand the importance of personal hygiene, including masks, the washing hands, and also keep social distance. And now people uh, no, they have to take, uh, uh, when they take the public transportation, they have to wear masks all the time. And uh, wear the mask when there's mass gathering, including uh, the temple, church, the concert, and the Colosseum, etc., etc. Okay, So, uh, Taiwan government is investing more in R&D of the rapid test kits and uh, uh, related pharmaceutical products. And also we have three companies who are uh, also producing vaccines for COVID-19 now and all enter the uh, phase one trial. Of course, Taiwan also signed the COVAX uh, agreement and uh, tried to procure from uh, other international pharmaceutical company of the effective vaccines. And uh, our government invests in public health more than ever. And I would like to say that Taiwan is willing to share and cooperate with regional and the global health partners all the time. And I would like to propose five dimensions that 
uh, the roles we can play in the public health society, like APEF and also all the universities and the research institutes. We can contribute in education, in our research, and also raise the awareness and the engagement of policy makers, provide innovative ideas, and also facilitate international cooperation. I visited Sri Lanka twice and met with Dr. Uh, Sunil Awis and Dr. Indika, who is a good friend to us. And I would like to visit this beautiful land again. Hopefully very soon with the effective vaccine is developed. And uh, I would like to say, let the collaboration continue. Thank you for your listening. Still tea. Thank you. Thank you. Xie xie, Betty. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's move into our next friend, Colin, Professor Colin Bins. Uh, uh, you can start your presentation after Betty. Professor Colin is a key, one of the key public health resource persons in Australia. Okay, <clears throat> just I've, <clears throat> I've just temporarily lost my uh, my uh, PowerPoint, but we'll have it here in just a second. Okay, can everybody see my screen there? Uh, yes, uh, can you put that into uh, side share mode of Colin? Side show? Yeah. Yes, yeah, up nearby. Uh, yes, yes. There we go, how's that? Yes, great. Okay, you caught me off guard just for a minute. Um, this is just a brief uh, presentation to explain to you what's actually happened in Australia. We've been very fortunate in that we have had a very mild epidemic here compared to some of the other countries. Uh, I'll show this slide again tomorrow, but you can see if you look at Western Australia where I live, we've only had 775 cases and nine deaths compared to some of the other countries, because we've only got a population of just under 3 million people. Overall, Australia has had around 900 deaths from COVID. Cases in Australia, we had the initial epidemic, and then in June, we had a number of cases which resulted from people spreading the virus while they were actually in quarantine. We have a policy of anybody coming from overseas, uh, and that's a very limited access anyway, spends 14 days in a hotel under quarantine. But unfortunately that broke down in Melbourne and we had this large spike in cases, all originating from a handful. As in most other countries, the peak of contracting the virus has been in young adults since they're out and about and communicating socially. But of course, as with other groups, the death rate in uh, our population has been mainly amongst the older folk and those who have chronic disease. In Australia, the number of cases has varied from state to state. As I said, there was a breakdown in quarantine in Victoria that led to the rapid 
spread throughout the community and an increase in number of deaths. Whereas in Western Australia and South Australia, where we have very strictly enforced quarantine of all cases, uh, that out secondary outbreaks did not occur. But you can see in Western Australia, we had no local transmission for the past 240 days. These sporadic cases, this for example, this peak is only three cases here, um, have only occurred on overseas arrivals or on sailors on ships that have arrived in our ports. So you can see the source of cases here. The red represents the cases coming from overseas. Uh, these are airline arrivals and shipping arrivals and local locally transmitted cases. It's just this small band of purple at the top, which hasn't been expanding. So what we have done, <coughs> we've been into force good public health practice, the detection of as many cases as we can, which has been almost all, as shown by community uh, serology surveys. We have extensive accurate diagnosis facilities. We enforce strict isolation of cases. If, for example, you come from overseas and you're confined to a hotel and somehow you manage to get out of that hotel, you then spend the rest of the quarantine, which you start over again in prison. Uh, it's not a very pleasant way of uh, escaping for a night's party or something like that. We've had thin, strict travel bans. We've banned flights coming from overseas, except in very limited circumstances. We closed all of the borders for our states. And in Western Australia, that means uh, if you want to come into state, you've basically got to walk through a thousand kilometres of desert, and that's enough to put anybody off. We've had our strict 14 day quarantines and uh, selected lockdowns, but in my state, life is, is pretty normal. We can go to the theatre, we can go to church, we can go to classes at the university, um, shopping centres uh, open um, at the moment. Nobody in West Australia wears masks except me, because I try to put out a message. Uh, there's widespread use of hand sanitizer and social distancing is publicized. And we've been pretty good at communicating with the public. If, of course, we have another outbreak, then we'll have to reimpose stricter controls, such as lockdowns. But that's a summary of the Australian situation. Thank you, Prof. Colin. And with that, we come to the end of this very important session. However, due to the interest of time, we will not be able to take specific questions. Uh, anyhow, if you uh, have any clarifications, you can always send them in the chat so that we can uh, divert them to the resource persons. And uh, uh, at the end of this very important presentation, I would like to thank my co-chair, Dr. Nihala Basinghar. And uh, then uh, Dr. Ananda Vijayavikrama, who is a very important resource person in Sri Lanka related COVID management. And we have a token of appreciation for the for the resource persons who are present in here physically. However, maybe we can send uh, some Sri Lankan tea to our overseas resource persons, hopefully. Thank you very much.